Hello and welcome to the first lecture of 2402, uh, the lecture portion that is, So, uh, and it's the endocrine system. My name is Dan O'Connell. I'll probably have put out an introductory uh, video, uh, which you probably have already watched, so I probably didn't even need to introduce myself. But in any case, endocrine system. Uh, we see on the right here in this image a dude with all of his uh, endocrine glands showing, right? And so we're going to go down this list. This list is pretty comprehensive and we'll cover all these and then a few more in the subsequent lectures. Um, each of these screencasts I'm going to try to keep short, uh, but let's see how well I do that. So you're going to have several per chapter. So let's go on to the background stuff about the endocrine system here. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of go down this bullet list and clear up some stuff. So these glands are ductless. You have sweat glands and uh, tear glands and things like that that have ducts that lead to the surface of something, right? So uh, your salivary glands are, are have, have ducts. So those guys are not endocrine. Endocrine glands are ductless. The hormones or their secretions will diffuse out of the gland and enter the bloodstream and then be transported to the, uh, around the body via the bloodstream. Uh, glands can be either completely endocrine or they can have exocrine endocrine or they can be a brain structure that produces hormones or they can your heart has an endocrine function uh, hormone levels are generally controlled by a negative feedback meaning that uh, they if they get too high you'll do something to drop them back down if they get too low you'll do something to raise them back up um, the blood sugar level let's just say uh, is a chemical that's monitored by your endocrine system and if your blood sugar levels get too high then you're going to secrete a, a hormone insulin which will lower it if it gets too low you'll secrete another hormone to raise it so you're generally trying to keep stuff homeostatically balanced generally not always uh, there are three different kinds of chemical messengers which we'll touch on here and there we're mostly going to concentrate on hormones which uh, i've already mentioned uh, autocrines auto is the uh, prefix there which means self so autocrines affect our chemical messengers that affect the cell that releases them and we'll have a couple of these that we point out paracrines are going to be short distance kind of like hormones so they're going to be secreted by one cell and received by nearby cells uh, glands respond to several different uh, stimuli humoral now don't get humoral and hormonal mixed up Humoral simply means um, chemicals found in your body fluids. So, you know, ion levels, uh, levels of, you know, how, how hydrated or dehydrated you are, I, you know, electrolyte concentration, stuff like that. Neural stimuli, so direct stimulation, when you get scared, when, when you get surprised by something, your brain is going to directly stimulate your adrenal medulla, which will then cause it to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then lastly, hormonal stimuli. So hormones secreted by one gland can affect another gland, which will then secrete hormone, which can then affect the third gland and so on. Uh, target cells is an important concept here, target tissues. Now the hormones are in your bloodstream, so they're, they're found everywhere. You get, if I'm releasing epinephrine, I'm gonna find it from the, my scalp to the tips of my toes, but only certain cells or tissues or organs are gonna respond to those Hormones, and they call those cells that respond target cells. And that response can depend on a number of things listed there. They're all pretty obvious. More hormone generally results in a greater response. Number of receptors on the cell, if, they, if that's large, then the cell will respond more strongly. And uh, how affinity is sort of that a term that, that means how l much of a desire the uh, receptor has for a hormone. So that can vary. Uh, the next three terms here, half-life, onset time, and duration, are, are affect uh, how long and how quickly hormones will act. Half-life is basically how long the hormone survives. So you release a certain amount of it, and it's going to suddenly, it's going to slowly degrade over time. Some degrade more quickly, uh, like water-soluble things like epinephrine. Others, like uh, certain ster the steroids, like uh, testosterone and estrogen, will have a longer. Uh, lasting uh, life in your blood onset time so once the this means that once the hormones released how quickly does the cell uh, respond uh, again you're going to want water soluble hormones are generally going to have these shortest uh, onset times and uh, steroids will have a longer one 
A good example is epinephrine. You want to respond quickly to that, but you don't necessarily have to respond as quickly to uh, melatonin. All right. Duration of effect is, don't confuse duration of effect with half-life. Duration of effect is the, the cell responds and then stays responsive or stays you know active activated for a certain amount of time. So uh, half-life refers to how long the hormone lasts. Duration of effect refers to how long the cell stays in response to that hormone. Uh, the last three terms here for this short lecture, permissive, permissiveness, synergism, and antagonism. Permissiveness simply means that uh, when you produce one hormone, it's only going to work to its full extent when another hormone is present and working. For instance, uh, you have a hormone prolactin, and we'll cover all these in later screencasts. Uh, prolactin is a hormone that stimulates mammary glands to make milk. Oxytocin is a hormone that stimulates the mammary glands to eject milk. So if you don't have prolactin, you're not going to make milk, and oxytocin won't work. See how that works? There's other examples, but you can read those in your book. Uh, synergism, they work better together. So aldosterone and uh, ADH antidiuretic hormone both act to limit water loss. So aldosterone, when present, is going to reduce your amount of urine output. ADH, when present, is going to reduce your amount of urine output. When they both are present, you're going to really not pee. Uh, and lastly, antagonism, they work against each other. Uh, glu uh, glucagon and insulin are one example. Calcitonin and parathyroid hormone here are another example. Calcitonin uh, like increases bone density. Parathyroid hormone removes calcium from the bone. So they, they work in opposite directions. All right, that's it for this, this uh, screencast. Uh, there's others, and go check them out. Make sure you read the notes that I'm sending out and read the book uh, and uh, come to my office hours with any questions you have.